So uh, as we sort of pull this up, one of the things that I wanted to sort of ask the room is, is how many of you come to this event having to take time off work, right? Your, your W-2 or your day job? Oh, not as many as I expected. So the reason I asked that question is I, I really did. I spent 15 years um, working in technology. Uh, I was a salesperson for different software organizations. And what that meant is my day job or my day wasn't really mine. Right? Uh, I was a traveling salesperson, so what that meant, just so you can have context of how I built this over 15 years, is I traveled a minimum of 100,000 miles, air miles a year, one year 200,000. Uh, my responsibility for most of that was the world, so I spent time in Europe, Asia, some in uh, North America, South America, so I was all over the place. Uh, one of the saddest days of my life is when I got a Platinum Marriott rewards card. I'm serious, it was a sad day when this thing showed up. Does anybody know what it takes to get a platinum Marriott rewards card? A hundred nights in their hotel. I don't know about you, but that's like one out of three days of a year, right? Maybe one in four, if you sort of round up. I knew I had to change when I got that, right? That's not a way to live, right? I was spending, when you add up travel, and I'm not sure where I should stand, not by the speaker, I think. Um, I knew I had to change because I was spending on average of 80 hours a week between working 9 to 5 and, thank you very much. Do I need this too? Do I need three mics? No. Okay. <laughs> hey, everybody give it up for Michael Zuber. I didn't get a chance to do that. Thank you. So uh, again, that was a sad day of my life. I knew I had to change. Uh, I'd already been in real estate about eight years at this point. Um, as you'll see, we'll, we'll go through the full time together. I had about uh, 45 or 50 units that were just cash flow properties, right? Um, I live in the Silicon Valley, as was shared earlier. Um, I knew I couldn't retire. I knew I had to do something. So uh, we'll go ahead and, and tell the story. Um, one of the things that I wrote down already, right, to talking about taking notes is uh, I think speakers need to have goals, right? They've come here to share and all of that. Uh, I've come here to learn from, from all the tremendous speakers, but one of the things that I took down already this morning is when Jim talked about changing lives, right? I've shared this story, I've shared our story, and I do it because I like to help people and help, help change their lives. So I'm hoping in this room, in this 45 minutes together, someone will come up to me later and, and really sh sh say that, hey, I, I think you helped me move forward or help me you know, get started or change, you know, change lives. Uh, how many people have a desire to have a rental but have less than four? Okay. One of the things that Jim asked me to kick off was sort of this talk about why four, right? How, how can you help people get started? So I have, I have found that if you can get to one, right, getting off zero is hard, right? Pulling that trigger is hard, right? You get stuck in spreadsheet madness, you get stuck in self-doubt and self-talk and your network sort of confusing you and all that stuff, right? Anybody been there? Yeah, I'm still there, and so that's never going to go away, so just embrace it. Um, but I find that once you can get that, you need to have a goal. And uh, when I tell our story, sometimes people get admired because we have 175 units now. That's over a million dollars a year in rental income. Right? So people see that and they go, oh, my God, I want to be you. Um, but but it, does, it sort of scares them at the same time. Right? So that's why I now have adopted the, the talk about just get to four. I like to talk about four because I think four changes your lives. Right, if you only ever got four, right, if you're a flipper, if you're a wholesaler, right, you have a job. You may not like to admit that, but guess what? You have a job. So I suggest as you're building this chunk money over time, maybe every fourth or fifth or sixth or tenth or whatever that is for you, find a way to secure a long-term asset, right? And that's going to be a landlord or a rental property, whatever you investment or whatever you want to call that thing. I think if you set up and had four, then you're conservatively financed, you hold for the long term, you let inflation do what inflation does, you let values increase, you let rent increase, your life will be fundamentally different in a decade. It will be wildly different in a couple of decades because that's what happens when you can hold for the long term. So that's what we're going to talk about today. All right? Uh, so I, I used to talk for a living. So if you have questions, just raise your hand and I'll, I'll, I'll call on you. All right? It, it's, let's have some fun together. So I assume this up arrow goes forward. Maybe it's the down arrow. Oh, it's the down arrow. <laughs> you never know. So I'm going to share my story in detail, sort of one slide, because I think it's important to know who's talking to you. 
Um, I've shared a little bit, but there's more to it. Uh, uh, I'm going to talk about why I suggest four, and again, we sort of already touched on it, but there's, there's more to it that we'll sort of get into. Uh, I, I do have some keys when starting out. Right? One of the things you get to do when you retire, and it's almost been a year, it was February 1st of last year, so that's a pretty good feeling. It's like a week away. It's pretty awesome. Uh, so I've, I've gone back and sort of self-selected and, and really pulled out what, what, what worked and what didn't, so we'll talk about that. Um, I'm going to talk about how to get started, right? Because I think there's three things, three ways to get started, right? Do you have money? Do you not? Right? Do you have time? Do you not? Right? So we'll talk about some ways to get started. Um, we'll talk about them in detail, right? So a little seed capital. Uh, as you'll see in my introductory slide, um, I started this journey with $40,000. Um, that's more than some, I get it, uh, but it's a lot less than others. Uh, so I thought we would talk about that. Uh, scenario two is very common. Uh, when I did this, it wasn't called this, but whoever created it, probably somebody on bigger pockets, burr, right? Buy, repair, rent, refi, repeat. Uh, I did that very, very a lot during the during the crash. Again, it wasn't called that. I just bought cheap stuff, fixed it up, and got my money back. But you know, hey, if you want to call that burr, fine with me. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then there's always, uh, you know, they don't have any capital, no, you know, no special access. You know, how do you get started? So we'll, we'll talk about that as well. Uh, and then I will close. Uh, with what's important to me. Yeah, burr, right? Hey, I'm California. This is cold weather to me, man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm soft, I admit it. Uh, and then we'll close with a few, uh, few core beliefs, okay? All right. So uh, every, you'll hear me say our, just so we know. You'll see it in a minute. Uh, our is my wife, right? the, other, the better half, frankly, um, Olivia. Uh, so again, we, uh, we're full, both full-time employees. Uh, we live in a city called Mountain View. If you don't know where that is, think Silicon Valley. If you don't know where that is, think Google. Right? We're literally like half a mile from the Google complex. Uh, and we've been there uh, since 99, so we've enjoyed all the wealth created because all these Googlers move in around us with too much money. We could, we could not afford to live where we are if we had to buy now. It's ridiculously expensive. And I feel terrible for uh, the millennials trying to buy into that. Uh, again, as I shared, uh, I traveled at least 100,000 uh, air miles a year, right? Uh, anybody ever been platinum on two airlines? <laughs> Done that. I was platinum on two airlines and gold on, on third. It's not a good quality of life. Um, I don't wish it on anyone, right? When, when I interviewed people and they were, they were talking about all the joys of travel, I'm like, yeah, I've been to a thousand places, but I've seen a freeway and an airport and a hotel. I mean, <laughs> is that really seeing a place? I don't know. Uh, the other thing is, is I was in a sales pr profession uh, where I had 90-day quarterly pressure, right? Whether it was a small software company, it was like making payroll, right? So like real pressure. Uh, or it was quarterly earnings that we had to hit, right? I ran teams uh, of dozens to hundreds. Uh, so um, the last 10 days of a, a, a quarter, I was not a very happy person. And it was like repeatable because like these 90-day cycles show up, guess what? Every 90 days. So it's, it's a horrible quality of life. Um, so I, I, was, uh, I knew I had to get out. I saw people a decade older than me pass away from it. Right? It doesn't have a long shelf life. Right? It is, when you travel 100,000 miles, you're always eating out. Yeah, your, your checkbook might look OK, but your quality of life. I never met someone a decade older than me in my profession that was what I would call healthy or even happy. Think about that. They're not healthy or happy. That's a clue, people. Uh, you know, life gives clues. So I knew I had to get out, and, and, and that's, why we were, that's why I knew I had to do something. Um, so we built a portfolio uh, two and a half hours away. Anybody know Fresno? Like, right? So Fresno is um, two and a half hours southeast of where I am. Um, you can actually live in Fresno very comfortably on $50,000 uh, a year. Right, so it's, it's, and it's got a million people, right? so it's a, it's a decent market. And uh, when I started 15 years ago, it was the only market that made sense. Anybody know the 1% rule? Right? So I bought a house for 107 grand on 1818 North Drive. You can look it up on Zillow if you like. And uh, it rented for 1095. Uh, you'll hear more about this house on one of my closing slides because it doesn't start well. So we'll, we'll talk about that just to tease that out a little bit. Uh, again, I already admitted we started with 40 grand. Uh, we'll talk about how I spent that actually in uh, the first scenario because I'll, I'll just I share everything, uh, and then we'll talk about uh, also how we how we grew this from a single three bedroom two bath two car garage that bought for 107 grand into 175 units. So we'll we'll try to give you all of that. 
the other thing that's interesting is I bought out of the MLS multiple listing service for 15 years. For the first 15 years of my career, I bought two deals not out of the MLS because I'm, I'm always just direct. I bought one on an auction site during the crash, right? Auction.com, go figure. And then I bought another one directly from a bank that saw what I was doing to a property literally next door. Other than that, every property I bought was out of the MLS. How many people in this room think there are no deals in the MLS? I agree, there's 99 point something percent of no deals in the MLS, but if you spend the time, there are deals. I have closed three deals, it's what, the 23rd? 22nd, 23rd? Wow, 24th. Well, it's California's three hours away, so it's still the 23rd. I've closed three deals in January, all of them were out of the MLS, right? I bought them all for, I bought two for $50,000 in list price and one for $60,000 in list price, right? It's possible, we can talk about those some other time. But again, it is possible. Now, now, now that I'm free, right, I have time, right, I'm not on an airplane and in foreign cities, I am working with wholesalers and I have leads coming in and networking a lot more. So I have bought a lot more stuff in the last 12 months, not in the MLS, but the MLS is still a source and as I've shared, I've closed three deals in January, all directly out of the MLS. So it is possible, if you're not at least looking there, you're not getting enough knowledge, right? Don't write it off. Right? At least spend the time. I still look every day uh, on the new listings and what's coming up. And again, I had no special access or system. I knew nobody in Fresno when I picked it. I let the spreadsheets tell me where to go. Now maybe that was stupid, it worked out, but maybe I got lucky, I get it. But again, I didn't have special access, my mother wasn't in the business, my dad didn't give me a trust fund, right? I knew no contractors, I knew no one. Right? When I heard Fresno, I'm like, is that in California? And I was born in California, right? I was born in Sunnyvale, grew up in Cupertino, live in Mountain View, right? I didn't know where Fresno was, right? I just started cir drawing circles on a map, right? But again, it's, it's, uh, it is possible to do this business with no access, no system, no relationships, no trust fund. Uh, the other thing that's important is market cycles. This was a huge benefit. So if you do math on 16 years of 2019, when did I start? That'd be 2003, people. Need more coffee in the room, Jim, next time? <laughs> Note to self. <laughs> so why is that important? Because again, what you should be taking away from all these discussions from the people speaking to you is, history kind of repeats itself in real estate. 2003 to 2008 was a seller's market. What, did we, what are we either in, arguably at the end of, or what just finished? Seller's, seller's market, right? So might it be interesting to figure out what I did at the end of the last seller's market? Right, kind of interesting, right? So let's talk about that. So one of the things you have to do is you have to leverage market cycles. And when I say market cycles, it's not only prices and demand and listings and all of that. Everything in real estate will have cycles when you think about it. Interest rates will have cycles, right? Interest rates will go up, interest rates will go down, right? Lending, just the access to capital will have ups and downs. Do you know what the easiest thing to get done between 2003 and 2000, call it seven was? Get a loan. It was ridiculously easy. I thought 2003 was easy until I got two loans for houses in 2007. They were, they, anybody know what an 80-10-10 is? Right, it was 80% first, a 10% second, I only had to bring 10% to the cap, you know, to the dance for a rental property that was two and a half hours away. Right, because countrywide at the time, right, which eventually got bought by Bank of America, those loans were fun, right? You know what the hardest thing to get done as a real estate investor in 2010 was? Get a loan. Get a loan. I actually felt dirty walking into banks, right? They just like, no, we can't lend to you. And I was like, what do you mean you can't lend to me? I have, you know, X amount of dollars in the bank. I have, I survived the crash. I lost no properties, right? I have all these, what do you mean, right? Sorry, you're a dirty word. Won't talk to you. Right? I mean, so I share this because if you're going to be in this business for any length of time, it is, things are going to change on you and you need to pay attention. Okay? Um, again, network is your net worth, as I think Jim so accurately set up. You will need them at different times. Right? Right? We, we got to where we were because we reached out to hard money lenders and because when banks wouldn't talk to us. And then we did private money because we, we had friends and family go and take, you know, basically take our money and, and help us grow it. So these are all things that when you get going will become tools in your toolbox. So that's why you should be learning the next three days is I'm here, 
right? I get to talk for 45 minutes, and then I get to learn from everybody else speaking. I'll be one of those speakers taking lots of notes because I know I don't know it all. Right? And again, I've been doing it for 15 years, but I've been doing this much of the business for 15 years, right? I've been a land, buy and hold landlord, right? Because I had a day job, right? I couldn't send out thousands of marketing pieces. I couldn't talk to people on the phone all the time, right? Because I had other responsibilities. So I will be one of those guys taking lots of notes. Um, so again, I celebrated this. Uh, I left February 1st of 18. Yay, me. Olivia, my wife, my lovely wife, left actually five years ago. So. Um, she usually comes out with me, but we have a sick puppy at home, so she decided to stay home with our sick puppy, which I, uh, I'm glad she did. Uh, and again, as Jim sh shared earlier, I uh, just published a book. It's been uh, eight months in creation. You know the hardest part of writing a book? Editing a book. <laughs> Go figure. <laughs> it, uh, it took two different editors in, in several months to get through that. Uh, if you ever look at the book, you'll see a picture of it at the end. Uh, and I have some here if you want them autographed or whatever. Uh, it talks about our 15-year journey. Again, I thought it was important to sort of document that. I call it the four phases, the up, the down, the, the bottom, and the return. Uh, I talk about 21 core beliefs. I talk about what we do in the last year because it's different, right? When you, all you can do is think about real estate, right? There's other things you can do when you have, don't have a day job. Uh, and then I close with 11 key themes I've built uh, the last year. That's, that's essentially the book in a nutshell. Uh, the other thing I didn't say on that slide is I actually have a YouTube channel. Um, I created that because uh, if you haven't noticed, I'm kind of type A. Right? I kind of like being busy. Um, so I retire February 1st. I have two days of sheer excitement. Right? You just tell everybody you retired. I had, I was, you ever seen the Joker right, in Batman? You know, that ridiculous smile? I think I had that for two days. Uh, but then I went into a pretty bad, I, I don't know if I would actually call it a depression. It certainly felt, I've never been that way, right, depressed, so I don't know what it feels like. Let's call it a depression. Because I didn't feel like I had something to live for. I didn't know what to do, right? Yeah, could I play golf or go to the, I'm sure, but that's not who I was. So uh, somebody pushed me to, to share our story. So I created a YouTube channel called One Rental at a Time, and I, I now post daily videos online. Uh, I either do something called Real Talks, which is just a topic going on in the industry. I do something called Subscriber Questions. This morning's video uh, was a subscriber question on Section 8. Somebody asked me what I think about Section 8, so I said, hey, Go talk about that. Uh, something that's really taken off and has been a tremendous success are interviews. Uh, you know, a lot of the people that we will see today will hopefully, graciously, uh, be on. A couple of them, Tom has been on, Jim's been on already. Uh, we're tremendous uh, interviews, and I just I ask them hard questions. We don't prep, right? Do we prep at all? No. I don't give you any any insight what's coming, and I just it's my show, baby. Uh, so we we just go with that, and they've been gracious enough to be uh, tremendous guests. Um, so again, and then we, the last one was we talk about deals. So something goes out every day. It could be as short as two minutes, or if it's an interview, it'll be about, I try to cap them at 30. Some are so great, they go 45 minutes. But again, I have to have something to do. And, and so every day something happens. Uh, and again, so since I've had time, I was never a flipper. As I had been in the book, I flipped one property by accident. Uh, does anybody, was anybody in doing deals like in, I think it was 2010, it might have been 11. Do you remember that $8,000 tax credit the government threw out there? Yes. I happened to close on a property, a, a fully distressed property from an REA, REA agent. I don't remember the number, but let's say it was 50 grand. I close on it. The government throws this $8,000 out, and suddenly the house is worth 100 grand. I'm not an idiot. I'll take 50 grand for you know, a couple of weeks. So I, I literally painted the inside, put in new carpet, and sold it, and flipped it. I felt terrible. I'm a buy and hold guy. What the heck am I doing sell, you know, doing this? I feel better because I bought three other houses later, but <laughs> I still felt bad. I felt, I felt dirty. It was weird, right? That just wasn't who I was. But so, you know, you never, you never go broke taking a profit. I just keep telling myself that. Where I talk about that now is I am flipping properties because, again, I have nothing else to do all day, right? So uh, I, bought, uh, I bought 20, 10 of them have already exited the system. Uh, profits just over 300, and I have some more in the works. Uh, again, things you can do when you have time. Uh, and then the last thing, in your, when you're in this business long enough, you will have the ability to raise private capital. Right? So I've raised private capital a couple of different times as you're reading the book. Once during the, the, the utter depression of real estate, right? and, P, and I paid 10%. Always interest only because I hate math, right? so interest only works. Right? So uh, that worked. Uh, now what I've done is I have people that want to participate, again, friends and family, right? So you've you got you to be careful how you market and do all of this stuff. But I believe in creating programs that are ridiculously good for your investment partners. Ridiculously good. I am not a greedy person. 
Right? So what I do now is I created a program that offers them 6% interest, just like a bank, right? Just interest only, right? So if it's $1,000 or $100,000, it's $6,000 a year or $500 a month, right? So they get a little, little, little trick. And then I give them 20% of the equity or the, the profit when the flip goes, right? So they're truly my investment partner. Then they get monthly summaries and write-ups and all that stuff. But the reason I share this with you is when you're doing this business long enough, think about how you can help your investment partners. I truly believe if you think about them first and how you protect them, not only more capital will come this way, you will feel better, it will go better, uh, and communication will be easier, and you will just keep recycling capital. So it's, um, it's a great place to be when you can get there as an investor. Okay, so why the four rental idea? Um, again, I already mentioned in the introduction, sometimes people get scared when they go, oh my God, 175, I can never get there, it'll take me three lifetimes, and blah, blah, blah. It won't, but that's what they think. So now I talk about four a lot. <coughs> How many people can count to four on one hand? <laughs> Dude, people, come on. Everybody, right? Because four is not a hard number. How many people think they can get one a year? How many people think they can get two a year? Right? Three, you get the idea, right? It's not a scary number. Right? So um, you know, if it's one a year, great. You can change your life. You can fundamentally change your retirement, whatever that is for you your future years, your legacy, your family, if you can just get to four. Um, does anybody know this, right? I talked about earlier market cycles, right? What is financing today like on your first four investment properties? I won't quite go ridiculously easy, like it was in 04, 05, but it is easy, right? There's real paperwork and real docs and not just signatures now, but it is easy. That's, that's really what drove me, you know, I'm not a smart man, right? Four, why not five? Well, because four is easy to get financed, so let's talk about four, right? So if you can get four, if you're a wholesaler or a flipper, you can get to, right, chunk money, chunk money, chunk money, keep, right? You can do this, right, and you can get bank financing. <coughs> All right, what's going on? Oh, there we go. Um, I believe having four rentals uh, over time will fundamentally change your life. And I conservatively finance. One of the things that you will hear from me is you have to conservatively finance your stuff. I don't generally believe in 100% financing. Yes, I know if you buy it cheap enough, you can make it work. But in general, I don't set that as an expectation. When I'm talking to other full-time employees and they say, hey, I got approved for a bank loan of 20% down, they're gonna finance 80%, right? If they have a job like I did, where money's not really the challenge, right? I, you know, you, you have some money in the bank. I actually tell them to put 30 or 35 or even 40% down. Because what I want for them is freedom of time, right? You don't have to think about it. If you put more down in that position, it's gonna be easier to finance, the, the cash flow will be easier. You can absorb those once, a, you know, the window broke or, you know, the, the, the garbage disposal went out or whatever it happens to be without being negative cash flow, right? So I really am a conservative finance. Most of the people I speak with are putting 30% down at, at least. Because again, I want it to be conservative finance because they're only trying to get to four. And then they're just going to hold for the next couple of decades. And then what happens, right? Appreciation, maybe they've doubled. Maybe they've gone up 50%. What else as a landlord goes up over time besides appreciation? Rents. Rents, right? Amortization takes down the principal as well, right? So you get more and more of that um, you know, net. So it's, it's a great place to be. Um, and really what this comes down to, in my opinion, when I'm talking to folks is, is <laughs> the options you have after a couple of decades, right? Let's just play it forward and say you had four. Just think for yourself, you had four. Let's just pretend that they're free and clear. So whenever that time is for you, 15 years, 20 years, 30 years, whatever that is, they're free and clear. You're now exiting whatever you do for a living or your, your child is going off to college or whatever that meaningful thing is for you. Um, what can you do with these four free and clear rental homes? This is a question for the room where you respond to me. <laughs> what can you do? You could sell them. You absolutely could sell them. I would not recommend it, but you absolutely could. What else? You could get a line of credit. You can actually go refinance, do what's called a cash out refinance. You could sell one, you know, if, you, if the other is small debts, pay off the others. So one of the things I'm talking to a lot of uh, parents who have young children, right? Young meaning one, two, three, right? So under five usually, is what happens if you bought a rental house, owned it until they were off going to college, and that was your education fund, 
right? Think about that. Your tenants are essentially paying for your kid's college. How cool is that? Right? And oh, by the way, you got fixed rate de debt, you got uh, interest rate deductions and tax savings and depreciation and all this other goodness. But you, know, you get to thank your tenants for sending your kid off to college. Right? Or if they're not going to college, which is, is okay, help them start their, their career or their thing or whatever they're going to do. Right? It's, it's about having options. It's about thinking long term. Right? As Jim mentioned earlier, I think in decades as, a, as one of those landlords. Right? I'm not thinking weeks or months. Um, so. so some of the keys when starting out. I never bet on appreciation. Right? Uh, I actually live in Silicon Valley. I spent a year, as I share in the book, looking for that magic cash flow house where I live. They never existed. I think they're unicorns, man. They're just not there. I don't know why anybody would buy in the Silicon Valley. It's ridiculous. It's great. I mean, I can't say enough bad things about Silicon Valley real estate as a landlord or an investor. So if you are telling yourself, I, I, as I share in my book, I had an investor take me in uh, his office on his whiteboard, say to me, I can afford four negative cash flow houses because I have a great job and I'm so muckety muck and blah, blah, blah. And because, you know, I, and then appreciation will save me. Guess what happened to that poor individual when the crash came? Lost them all, had to declare personal bankruptcy. How'd that feel? Right? I saw people that were worth $10 million and above, because again, I've been doing this a long time, lose everything in the crash. Never, ever, if you ever listen to me or watch the channel, you better not ever talk to me about appreciation. If you happen to sell, then we can talk about appreciation. Oh, how much did you appreciate? How much did you put in the bank? And yeah, high five. We are never talking about appreciation if you talk to me. Zero. I don't want to see it in a calculation. I don't want to see, oh, if it grows 4%, blah, blah, blah. No. We okay? Yes. With me. Do the deal on today's value, and that is it alone. I guess I'm pushing the button. Uh, over, always conservatively finance. I want you to be thinking about holding for a decade. The reason we survived the crash is everything I own cash flow. Interesting fact. Do you know what, when the crash happened, let's just say I own 50 properties in the crash. Do you know what happened to my net worth? It collapsed. <laughs> Got whacked in half. You know what happened to my income statement? When it got better. My income statement, which is where rents come in, went up. My occupancy went up. My rental amounts went up. Oh, let me think. Do you pay your bills on your balance sheet or your income statement? Yeah. Yeah, you talk about your net worth and all that yada de yada at the parties, right? I'm worth X. Pff, who cares? You can't spend that. Right? Talk about your income statement. Tell me about your gross and tell me about your net. Let's have that discussion. Right? That's why I was able to survive the crash. Not only survive, but frankly prosper, as you can read about. I don't know why this is moving forward. I guess I timed it. Uh, so again, if you're a busy professional, I don't want you to think ROI. I want you to think return on time. <coughs> think about that. I talk to too many investors who have crazy busy day jobs, and they're talking to me about, oh, this one's 5.5, and that one's 5.8. And I talk, I talk about a story uh, on one of the videos where um, let's just use this. One return was 5%, right? Everybody, a cap rate or yield or whatever you want to call that was 5. And this one was 10. On paper, which one do you want? 10, right? If that's the only option, duh, 10, stupid. That's twice as big. Got it. But the 10 was a multi-unit, six-unit apartment building, uh, C-class neighborhood. This investor never owned anything in that area before. Uh, anybody see any red flags yet? Right? It's going, to be, it's going to take time to manage. I own lots of stuff in that kind of area, so I'm not talking down that area. But what I'm saying is, if you've never done it before, and you already have a very busy day job, and you're trying to self-manage, you might have a problem. Or the 5% is a triple net office building where you do nothing. Guess which one I told him to go after? Five, because you should be thinking return on time. If you were like me and you're spending 80 hours a week working, doing 100,000 or 200,000 miles of air miles, you should think return on time first. Don't get lost in all these stupid Excel spreadsheets. Get in the game, right? Remember what you're in this for. So return on time is important. Wow, this is really going. Uh, so no alligators. 
Uh, if you ever look me up, there's actually an icon I had somebody create. It's an alligator chewing on a bag full of money and dollar bills and stuff. Because I don't think negative cash flow is painful enough. Wow, look at this. It's really going. Do this. No, I'm doing it. Yeah, so no alligators. Negative cash flow. Because again, I don't think neg negative cash flow is negative or painful enough. So I created an alligator eating your money. I created one alligator in my life. It was the first property I bought I shared on Norris Drive. I did a cash out refi because I didn't know any better. And what do you do when you do a cash out refi and you don't know any better? You take the maximum amount. Freaking idiot I was. Right? I turned a property that was, let's call it $150 a month positive into $100 negative. Now I did go out, I didn't do anything stupid. I didn't blow it on a new car or a jet ski or a crazy vacation. I bought more real estate. So in general, I was net positive, right? I bought two, this one went negative. So if you add them together, but that's not how I look at my portfolio. I look at that asset and that asset and that asset. These two were fine. That one hurt every month. Conservatively finance, right? See, a lesson learned, aha. Uh -huh. Don't ever create a negative cash flow property. Buy or create. I have created one. They're not fun. They are very painful. Uh, the other thing I like to do is I like to tell stories and create things that kind of jolt you out of your, your seat. So when I say crap, it kind of gets your attention, right? But it's all capital letters. So it stands for something. It stands for cash, rich, asset, poor. Aha, look a creative guy. Crap. You don't want to be crap. Being cash, rich, asset, poor is very, very risky in a world full of inflation in a world where things happen in life. Cash is trash, you've heard that lots of times, right? So there are just, having assets is where you wanna be, right? So again, we'll talk about the opposite of crap at, uh, at my closing slide. I do not believe you can save your way to retirement. There are some people in Silicon Valley who get lucky IPO money or RSU money or whatever, they, once in a lifetime stuff. I'm not that guy, I'm not that lucky, right? I'm not a baseball player or a singer where these seven figures show up every month. So I don't think you can save your way to a secure retirement. I think that's what the financial institutions want you to believe. Oh, do the 401k and you know, do the whole company match and blah. It's, not, it, it, it's, a, it's a story we believe because it's comfortable. Right? Do something for 40 years and life will be great. I, I'm into clues, people. Look at the people that are now retiring. Are they like mostly in okay positions? How would you like to retire in a bear market? Whew, that hurts. Right? You've been stocking away, stocking away. Oh, life's good, life's good. Bull, bull, bull. Bear. You lose 30%. But it was here. Well, sorry, now it's here. So it's, it's tough. Um, so that's why I, I push and really believe if you had four conservatively financed rentals, you have options, as we shared about earlier. You could, you could sell, you could refi, you could, you could move, that, move the equity around. Lots of great stuff. Uh, again, buy and hold, I think you have to think in 10 years, if not forever. If you talk to me, I'm, I'm, I'll give you a decade. We can have those conversations. But in general, I'm thinking about the, most of the stuff I have, I will, I will, I will I, guess what? I'm going to die someday. I feel confident saying that. <laughs> I'm not going to give you a date, but it's going to happen. Uh, and then my daughter uh, will get everything I own and be happy for it. Uh, and again, um, focus on your core. Uh, what I mean by that is what you are good at. So when, we, when Jim went around and, you know, what do you do for a living? All of you come to this table with something. Right, you're a, a contractor, you have the GC skills, you can manage teams, right? You're a realtor, you have access to unlimited amounts of information. If you're a wholesaler, you know how to market and take leads and do a click funnel and all that. You all have something. So figure out what you're good at, network here, and complement. Real estate is a people business. I say that a lot, and it's actually on one of my closing slides. Right, so for me, uh, it was securing capital and then managing a team. I did nothing else. I have not, I technically I did paint one unit just to prove I could because my wife was making horrific fun of me about spending 600 bucks to paint on one bedroom. I'm like, okay, fine, I'll go do it. I did it, it sucked, I had to get it repainted. <laughs> that was a bad deal. <laughs> Don't do that, stupid. Yeah, it's, it's bad, but anyways, so do have, just be comfortable with that. So ways to get started. Um, you have some seed, camp, seed capital. Uh, you have good credit, or if not great credit, but a crazy life. Where do you start? So I'll break down our first four year, years in the business here shortly. Uh, then there's the whole BRRRR strategy, which again, I did repeatedly. It wasn't called that sexy acronym, uh, but we'll talk about what I've done there. Uh, I've helped lots of people start with no money uh, and no connections, but where we go. So I'm gonna break each of these down for you now. How are we doing so far? Great. Awesome, okay. <coughs> okay, 
So uh, if you ever want to look it up, again, you want me to, I've said it a few times fast, I'll slow it down. It is 1818 North Drive East, 93703. Sometimes you guys like to look this stuff up. Go ahead to Zillow. You can see what I bought it and what I sold it. And then somebody lost it and somebody bought it back. So you'll see that whole track record. We bought it for 107. I didn't know any better. So I put 20% down. I didn't know you could do anything different. So I put, I put half of my capital. Remember, I started with 40 grand. Right, so this is all math, people. About nine months later, I found another property on Terrace. It was, I don't know why I didn't just say 100, but it was 101. So guess what? It's 101. So I put $10,000 down. How much do I have left? 10. Awesome. We're paying attention. Coffee's kicking in. <laughs> so about, <laughs> I love you guys. So uh, about nine months later, so it's been 18 months. I close on my third house. My, my capital is gone. I'm at zero, right? Guess what happens? I did a refinance. I already sort of told the painful story, right? I took that first property. I created an alligator, remember? So I did a cash out refi. I pulled everything. So I pulled my original 20 back, and they said they'd give me another 20. Again, I didn't know any different. I admit it was a mistake, but I took it all. And I bought two more houses, same way, 80-10-10s. Uh, so I was only putting 10% down. This is, again, during 03 to 07. And a year later, I took the first house, or the second house, Terrace, and did the same thing. Right? So I'm just doing cash out refinances, right? Because markets do what markets do. And th in my, this happened to be a seller's market, as I mentioned earlier. So it was giving me equity. And I could do a cash out refi, so I did. Uh, and then at the end of that four year period, we had six houses leveraging that initial capital of $40,000, thanks to appreciation and refinancing. OK? So that's how you can do this. Again, I didn't blow it all in one year. I have met people that are in such a rush. Right? One, of the, one of the dangers, right? let's just say you had $40,000 in your, your, or your bank account or whatever. I have met people that are in my position where you have no time. I still remember a conversation I had. Somebody went down to my market, to Fresno. Somebody from the Silicon Valley went down to Fresno because they saw me talk or whatever. And they came back after that weekend. They said they bought three houses. I'm like. You heard some schmuck? Yeah, it was me, but still. Talk about a market you have never been to. And you took all your hard-earned capital and you bought three houses. Huh? I mean, don't do that. Like, don't be in a rush. Right? Go, one at a time is OK. That's what the, hence the whole one rental at a time. Just let time help you and move forward. So all right, if, you're not, if you rush into it, it's, it's called gambling. And uh, I don't gamble. So Burr, I love that. I, I, think that, I don't know who did that. I, I, that's a genius. Brandon Turner, right? I think I actually wrote on Bigger Pockets for a long time. I think he took my story and did that <laughs> freaking guy. Now he's off in Hawaii having a good time. <laughs> so here's a story I did burr with. So uh, I bought a house uh, on Norris Drive. I write about it in the book. I call it Little Nevada. Uh, for, it was technically 69 grand. So here I round up. It was a really rough house. Uh, I established a private money lender. Something I do in my programs is they only come in for uh, the purchase price. I fund all the repairs out of my own pocket. Uh, in this case, uh, let's say we were paying them 12%, again, for easy math. So that's $700 a month, right? So it's still ugly. House is still ugly. Um, needs $40,000 in work. I happen to have the $40,000, so I believe in putting in my money at risk first. If you don't have that, you can go out and borrow that as well. In this case, I paid that. But if you are borrowing it, let's just assume 12% again. So that portion would be a $400 payment. My uh, after market or after remodel values were I got a signed lease for twelve fifty, and uh, I ended up selling the house for one sixty nine. But let's say the value was one hundred and sixty nine thousand dollars. Everybody with me so far? Right. This is over about a ninety day period. Right. Jim talked about flippers thinking in months. This this is the months. So what we did, or what you could do, is you can go get a seventy percent loan to value. Right. That would be extracting one hundred eighteen thousand three hundred dollars. And you could then, you know, you will have at the end of that, you know, rough math said you'll have $8,000. If really think about transaction costs and all of that stuff, you're probably walking around with $4,000. But you would have done a successful Burr strategy. That's probably four to five months <coughs> from purchase of ugly, destroyed, you know, squatter house to fully remodeled, fully leased at market, beautiful house, right? 
And if you ever go to my YouTube site, you'll actually see videos of the befores and afters of that. It's called Little Nevada, if you ever look it up. Does that make sense for everyone? Yep. Right? So you were paying how much if you had to borrow everything during the, call it, four-month hold? Let's see if we can do some math. 1100 right? You go, go back, you do all this, you actually borrow mo more money because you borrowed 110 before. Now you're borrowing 118 from a bank. Your payment gets cut roughly in half. <coughs> it's 625 This is why the Burr strategy works. Right? But you have to buy them right. right? I couldn't have paid 100 grand for that house and made this work. Right? I like to buy, again, I'm into simple. I like to buy below 50% below what my after repair value is. Does that always work? No. Sometimes the house is too far gone. It's, you know, tear down. Don't buy those. <laughs> right? So that's where I try to, try to buy. So I bought a house for 70 that had an after repair of 170. So I had plenty of room to make that successful. Everybody okay? Awesome. <coughs> and then if you have no cash and no access, no <coughs> you know, none of that, these are the things that I recommend. First, you have to recommend, and I am, you, are gonna, you are in for a treat tomorrow when Max Maxwell speaks. I've heard him speak a couple of times. I've heard all the speakers speak before, uh, but I think you're going to love his story because he starts, he calls it broke, broke. When he says broke, broke tomorrow, I want you all to laugh and chuckle because I told you it's coming. <laughs> right? So broke, broke. Um, you, you can start from anywhere in this business uh, and, and um, be very successful. You got to focus your energy on becoming assets to buyers or sellers, preferably both. Right? Jim talked about earlier in his introduction being that networker when he exited the, uh, the, the workforce. Right? He built a list of 3,000, all of that. He was being a, a, of service to buyers and of service to sellers. So um, you need to do that. Buyers in general, are usually like me where time is my issue. How many would believe that I've never spent a night in Fresno after 15 years? And I own a lot of, lot of I've never spent a night in Fresno. Right? So one of the things that's valuable to my network are people driving for dollars and wholesalers and bird dogs and all of that stuff. Right? I choose, I live where I want, but I invest where the numbers make sense. Right? So the numbers make sense in Fresno, I live where I want, my wife loves the valley, so we're staying. I wish we could leave and we could get all this equity back, but can't. Ah, I'm, not, I'm not bitter. <laughs> uh, I'm so glad she's not here because I would pay, I'd be on the couch for that comment. <laughs> Don't tell her. Um, so again, so time is my issue. So understand what their deals are. And do you know what, how to find out what a deal is to a buyer? Thank you. Ask them a question. What do you look for? Right? If you, if you are a buyer and somebody asks you that question, I'm going to give you the, the words not to say. You ready? You going to write this down? I just want a deal. <laughs> not helpful and probably dangerous because what's a deal to me is not a deal to you. And any dummy who ever, I still get that. Just give me a, give me a deal that you're not going to do. <laughs> really? You think I'm in a position where if, I'm, if I see a deal, I'm not going to get the deal done somehow, some way? You want my leftovers? It's probably not a, not a long-term strategy I would be betting on. Right? So if you are a buyer, know your buying criteria. Tell, I like three twos, less than 50 years old, with a garage, carport. I'm, get, I want multi-units. I want side-by-side. -side, I want rear, rear yard, front yard. I don't care what you want, but know what you freaking want. And then tell everybody. Okay? Sellers, if you're a bird dog, wholesaler, driving for dollars, all of this stuff, what do you have to do for sellers? Right? You have to help them with their problems. Usually it's condition or time. Do you think most people that put stuff in the MLS are motivated? No. They have signed up for a minimum of 90 days and some do it for 180 days. Does that scream motivation to you? No, it does happen, and I've already admitted I did three deals that way. And blah, just 99% of the stuff's not there. So in general, you're not going to you're not going to find stuff that qualifies for MLS. So if they can wait three months, nine or six months, if the house is pretty and it'll go FHA financing, sorry, most of the time not for you. Go look for the challenges. Go have those discussions. They're out there. They're in every city and every market I've ever been to, and in, even today, where wholesaling is is the new um, new thing. They're still everywhere. There's more deals out there than is possible. I get deals brought to me every day. 
And I probably say yes one out of 10 times. But still, they're out there. People are doing this very successfully, as you will hear from uh, Max tomorrow, I'm sure. So this makes sense in scenario three? So my last slide, which is good, because I got the 15 minute hook. So we'll be, we'll be done early. So financial freedom. It actually starts with what I call good, good defense. Um, it's not about your income, people. Uh, this, this is a fallacy that I grew up with. This is a saying um, that my mom had. I remember it so much because I heard it every day going to grade school. Now, Michael, Michael, right? The only person to ever insist on calling me Michael is my mother. So, Michael, your job is to go to school, get a good education, so you get a good job and buy lots of nice stuff every freaking day. I can, I can close my eyes, be in that brown Civic, and hear this saying. People, it's not about the income. It's not really even not about stuff, right? It's more about experiences and, and being of service and all of that stuff. I lost the decade of my 20s because I believed it was all about stuff. I got the nice car. I got the silly watch. I got the silly, I, I got it. It's a waste. I could have been retired in my 30s. I lost a decade of my life I can never get back because I was doing stupid things with my money. Right? So good defense means live below your means, save, invest, don't buy, don't upgrade your house because you just got a, a raise. Don't, how, if you are in a household that has two drivers, two licensed drivers, and you have three freaking cars, <laughs> I know people with five cars and two licensed drivers. Come on, people. How are you, you going to retire in early when that kind of spending? It's ridiculous. So remember, good defense. <coughs> I do believe, and I've shared it earlier, this is a phrase I have a lot, is live where you want. Wherever you want. The real estate is one of those things you can literally do from a beach in Phuket, Thailand, if that's where you want to be. I could be living in Phuket, Thailand, and investing in Fresno, California. Absolutely could. You invest in building the network, you set up the communications, you find a way to get contracts back and forth, because maybe Phuket's not great connect. You got a couple of wrinkles to figure out, right? Get FaceTime going up, people walking properties you trust, right? Get inspections. You can do this anywhere. So please, live where you want. However, that last part of the sentence is very important. Invest where the numbers make sense. <clears throat> One of the things I believe you're going to hear from Tom Olson later is about Gary, Indiana. Talk about a market that makes sense. Right? I'm going to probably spend some time there personally to see if that's another market I want to go into because the numbers make sense. Right? Live where you want, but invest where the numbers make sense. Again, I, I said it earlier, we laughed and chuckled. Uh, but crap, right? all caps with periods, so I'm not swearing at you, uh, is not a way to live. I don't believe being cash rich and asset poor is a, is a recipe for success. I meet people all the time that talk about their six figure 401k and I'm like, yeah, you're one oops from that being gone, right? You, you, you exit in a bear market, right? I go back to the people now and talk to them, it's like, well, I lost 30%. How'd that feel? Well, that probably didn't feel very good, right? So again, having assets that appreciate in, asset pro, um, inflation protected, paid off by others, I mean, it's, it, rental property is a great place to be. I promised you the opposite of crap. <coughs> and this is a challenge for the room. If you can create a better acronym that's the opposite of crap, that's, has, here's the rules, four letters, and it's an actual word, I'm game. So far, ARCH is the winner. It stands for asset rich, cash happy. See? Not just a hat rack. I don't think that's the best one out there. But until you give it to me, that's the winner. Okay, so again, asset rich, cash happy. Because I don't want you to be cash poor, right? I want you to be cash happy. Right? You gotta have a reserve, you gotta have a little walk around money, all that stuff, so asset rich, cash happy. This is the big one for me, especially if you're a full-time employee like me. And if you ever freaking tell me I just want a deal, I'm gonna, if I can, if I'm in an okay mood and I have my coffee, I'm just gonna come back and say, what's your acquisition criteria? This is the number one thing to get right if you feel stuck. Anybody ever been stuck in analysis paralysis? I'm still there after 15 years, so it happens to the best of us. This is what you have to get in your mind. Go away, get away from your Excel spreadsheet, and think about 
what, what you want to buy, right? Is it a, is it a 5% return? Is it a 6% return? Is it a, a, I don't care what it is. Maybe it's new construction on a street that begins with the letter A. I don't care what the freaking requirements are, but get yours down. And then when something pop, you know, walks across your path that hits your requirements, pull the trigger. It should be non-emotional. It's not, oh, it's facing the wrong direction and it's pink when it should be yellow and, ah. Oh. No, know your acquisition criteria. Be able to tell your friends and family what it is. It's not a secret, people. Once you know what yours is, tell everybody. Tell the wholesalers, tell the bird dogs, tell your realtors, tell your, tell your competition. Because guess what? Your criteria is probably not theirs. And this is a network business. This is a people business, as you will see on the other side of this slide. This is a people business. Don't be shy. Don't live behind your computer. Sorry. Get out in the real world, talk to people, have conversations, go see stuff. Uh, here's one. Real estate will test you over and over again. It still tests me to this day. <laughs> right? And by test you, I mean throw bad things at you. Right? Right? So um, you, will, you, will ha you have some days that feel great, you have months that feel great, you may have a year feel great, and then something's going to happen. Real estate's trying to kick you out of the business. I'm convinced that real estate is trying to kick you out of the business. Because it knows that if you're in this long enough, you're going to be wildly successful, wealthy, and happy. But it's trying to test you to see if, it's, if you really are game. Are you committed to this or not? So this is what I promised you. I told you earlier, remember I told you the Norris Drive story didn't start out well? So let's rewind the clock. It's 2003. We've just spent a year of our life looking in the Silicon Valley for that magic street that had cash flow. And as I admitted, admitted we didn't find anything. Think about that. 52 weeks, literally, either a Saturday or Sunday, we were in our cars driving around. Seems committed. We finally have that kitchen table conversation with my wife, Olivia, much smarter than me, says, why are we only looking 30 minutes from our home? I'm like, because that's what the books say, right? It doesn't make sense where I am. So we pull out a California map, start drawing circles, we find Fresno. Spend about a month looking at Fresno, and we finally, fight, we finally find something that hits our acquisition. It's 1818 Norris Drive. We buy it, 107 grand. We paid list price because it was a seller's market. That's what you do in a seller's market, right? It rents for 1095. You could not believe the feeling when that tenant moved in, right? Because now we're like 13, 14 months into this thing, and we finally have we're finally landlords, right? We celebrated. We had a dinner. We're high five and we're hugging. We're doing stuff what married people do, right? It was awesome. <laughs> Y'all know. Come on. <laughs> Draw a picture. Tom, that's for you. Can you start with that picture for me? <laughs> Love this guy. So two weeks later, real estate tests you. Unbeknownst to us, the wife and husband break up. She leaves never to be heard from again. We hear she goes to Arizona or Texas or whatever. Don't know. Can't find her, right? The husband decides to turn to the bottle and uh, make drinking and destroying our uh, rental house his uh, personal job. Uh, I've already admitted that we invest in California. Uh, and in California, evictions aren't quick. Uh, so we have about 90 days of um, lost rent, eviction charges. Uh, and at the end of the day, we spend about $15,000 rehabbing this property. So I want you to think about it. It's been six months now, right? We got that, we got first month's rent. We got the deposit. Well, guess what? We kept it. <laughs> Shocking. <laughs> it, helped that. it paid for the lawyer. And then we, we lost rent. Do anybody think we had to pay our mortgage? Yeah. Right? At $15,000, we had to pay. Get back in. <coughs> so see what I mean by real estate will test you? Right? What I didn't share with you earlier is we got into real estate because we were burned out stock market investors. Right? We, we made a lot of money day trading until we didn't. So we're like, this, this is gambling. This is stupid. Then we get into real estate. We spend 13 months doing something we think we won. Then it kicks us in the teeth. My wife could have said, I see. I told you it's rigged. It's, we're not doing this. It's too far away. I told you Fresno sucks. I mean, it could have been ugly. No. We were in this 100% together. She's like, great, cost of doing business, let's keep going. 
I applaud her every day. I give her credit in the book. We, I would not be standing here today. We would have taken a loss on that property. Uh, but as you've seen, that property did great things for us. Not only did we do a cash out refi that bought more stuff, we ended up selling it during the, the peak and we 1031 all of that money uh, into apartment buildings. We actually exited the seller's market by selling all of our houses. Technically not selling, sorry accountants in the room. We exchanged. We sold all of these units and we, we went from eight units to 80 units. No new capital, right? We just did a 1031 exchange in the small apartment buildings and I talk about all of that uh, in the book and on the videos. But again, what's important about this statement is couples must be committed. I do not want to talk to people that are 99% committed because real estate's going to test you and you're going to have the Norris Drive story happen to you in some way, somehow. And if you're going to go pick on your partner and say, see, I told you, don't get started, don't even bother. Not a place to go. This real estate business is hard. Right? It's easy to get going and all that, but it's going to test your metal. Are you in or not? Right? It still happens to me to this day. Now the good story, again, Norris Drive ends well. We sell it for 265. We buy a five unit apartment building. Get this, we sell Norris Drive that rents for 1100 for 263. You can look it up on Zillow or 266, whatever. We buy a five unit apartment building that rents for almost three grand for 223. Uh, market's weird, right? Market cycles, right? So. The market, when the market tells you to get out of one asset, don't be afraid to 1031 exchange into others. We, we got great success with small 5 to 15 unit buildings at the peak. Uh, the affordability index. I often get asked, how did you save yourself from the crash, right? Because we owned assets that were grossly overpriced in 08, grossly. Right? That freaking house. You know how much that house rented for in Norris Drive that I sold for 263? 1100 Remember what I paid, what it rented for when I bought it at 107? 1100. Huh? Yes, countrywide. Thank them. <laughs> but again, right? The affordability index told me it was no longer affordable. I don't know why. I mean, Bruce Norris gets the credit. I, I heard him talk about it, and I sort of I'm a numbers guy, econ grad, so I drove into it. And the affordability index went from like 45 when I started in 03 down to 12. I just knew it wasn't affordable. I couldn't buy anything. I wasn't going to buy the next thing, and I knew I wasn't done investing. So I had to do something. So we sold all, exchanged all the houses, and we went into apartment buildings, and that's how we survived and prospered during the crashes, because we got out of the stuff that was overvalued and into the stuff that was undervalued. And our cash flow went up, our income went up, our net worth probably went down, but again, I shared earlier, it doesn't matter what your net worth is. The other thing to realize, and I only got this after I retired, is there's actually quality differences. And, and I talk about this as the MLS, because again, as I admitted, I bought most of my stuff out of the MLS over these years, multiple, list, multiple listing service, Realtor.com, Redfin, all of that. So everybody knows what a beautiful house looks like, right? right call them turnkey, call them pride of ownership, so whatever you want. Right? Those are ones that you can buy for um, FHI financing, 20% down, they appraise, they're inspections, they pass with flying colors. Right, those, are part, those are priced at market. Anybody ever see a listing that says rented under market, feel free to raise rents, tenant lived in? Anybody ever see one of those? Yes. I bought a lot of those in the beginning. Right? They're usually 20 or 25 percent below the beautiful properties. But I'm here to tell you, having been that guy that bought lots of those, those first seven houses were those, it actually takes a lot of your cash. Because right? you're still probably putting 20 percent down. In today's market, giving lending, they may not even appraise, right? Because lending is sticky on that. But let's just assume they do. But what does your Excel spreadsheet tell you? And again, I tell you this because I made the mistake. What does your spreadsheet tell you? It tells you if you raise rents to market, life is great. Right? You take 800 to 1,000, and you only paid 150 for something that's worth 200. What happens? Cash flow goes up. Guess what? Tenants don't live in spreadsheets. If you raise somebody's rent for 800 to 1,000 for a rundown dump, what's the best case scenario? They leave. That's the best case scenario. They leave your place. Worst case is, and this will happen most of the time, and again, this may be a California thing because we have horrible eviction timelines. They're going to probably not pay you that next month's rent, and they're going to force you to evict them. They're going to buy three months of free rent and party on your dime. And guess what happens when they leave? You still got to fix up the place. And guess what? You're fixing that up with cash. You're not borrowing that money. So I have found that that kind of 
well-used property I call now actually consumes more cash. And again, that was a mistake for me in the beginning. I should have bought the cleaner properties because again, time was the problem, right? I shouldn't have, because I ended up spending more cash doing the down payment, which felt better day one, but over six months, I, I deployed a lot more capital. And just to round out this story, then there's the third type that you can only buy with cash. Nobody should be living there. Unfortunately, sometimes people do. It, I don't, these slumlords out there, I, they, there's a special place in hell for them, frankly. Um, you know, the, the, if you're just starting out in this business of being a landlord, don't buy that stuff because it's so much risk for you. You don't have the time, don't have the contractors, don't have the, it's just a recipe for disaster. But if you are a flipper and a wholesaler and all that, go find those, because I believe <laughs> the more slumlords that we can turn into quality rentals anywhere in this country, just, you have a special place in heaven where the other people have a special place in hell, right? It's just, it's sad what I see going on. Nothing makes me happier today turning something that is just, should be torn down into a beautiful property. Um, so those are the three quality differences. Uh, and then real estate's a people business. If you haven't figured that out, so I think most of you have, you're here, uh, kudos to you. Real estate is a people business. Network, ask questions, all of that stuff. It's, it's, you never know, again, know your acquisition criteria, share it, talk. You never know where these connections will lead you. Uh, it's still why I go to events like this and, and network because you just never know where that one connection will help you going forward. So again, this is me. I actually, because if you're part of Jim's event, you're important to me. So I give you my email. It's mzuber at one rental at a time. Hey, everything I do is one rental at a time. Shocking. <laughs> God, I'm a simple man. I actually gave you my cell phone number. I don't normally do that. Uh, but that's my cell phone number. Uh, and then there's the YouTube channel. Guess what? It's called one rental at a time. There's daily videos. And that's the book. I'm going to write your cell phone number down. <laughs> How'd you guys like that? Great. All right. I'm serious.